Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Philip DeMio, and it's good to be back in uh, Boston. I used to work out here. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and Columbus. But it's great to be back at the self-appointed Mecca of Medicine here. Uh, and um, I, I used to be told when I was out here, Lyme is a very brief self-limited illness, and you're either going to catch it or you're not, and the patient's going to get symptomatic, and they're going to acutely be treated with some amoxicillin and maybe some rocephin, and that's it. Well, we all know that's not true, so, and I'm speaking for myself when I say this. Um, I'm not apologetic or anything that this is a serious illness that's chronic. I think those of us either treat it or have it or both realize that we need things to treat the chronic phase of this. And the immune system is devastated in Lyme and associated diseases, so it's good to be able to discuss this. The, the Enhancer product I don't own, let me just say that right off the bat. Um, you know, neither of us up here have profit in it, and, and, and it's just something that I was called by Mr. Israel, who owns the Lee Silsby Pharmacy, he's out there, and asked me one day if we could work on developing dosing and how to use this substance, because he had the raw material. Um, the first thing I said was, well, it's out of India, which is a wonderful place, but a lot of contaminated products come from the Asian market. He had had it tested already. We've tested it further many times since. And it's always stood up to heavy metal tests and contaminant tests and so on. It's a very, very pure product. Second, if you get the spice curcumin, which is the color out of turmeric, it's the pigment, it doesn't absorb real well, which isn't a bad thing, but it's just that plain old turmeric that's out there is different than the Enhanza product. Enhanza is enhanced absorption. It's subfractions. It's not esterified. It's not heat treated. It's not phosphorylated. It's a pure subfraction set that absorbs better. That's why I got interested in it. That said, the absorption will make, among other things, the immune system improve. And so um, you'll see a little bit of the data we had here. And so you can get Herxheimer reactions, but they're gentler. And Tom used a protocol for adults. I have a lot of children in my practice. I see a lot of autism, as those of you who know me know. And so the bottom line is I ramped it up uh, when we did this. So as we developed the product, we used a ramping protocol so that the stimulating effect that can come as, uh, as an excessive amount is absorbed it was avoided, and so I did that in, in uh, the original study, and so you'll see that, and I'll briefly just show you the slide. Um, other side effects that can happen with curcumin products, all of them, um, and this one's more highly absorbed, you can get a mild sunburn, um, just using sunscreens and cover up, uh, and it doesn't happen to everybody. And there's some other mild issues that really are not a problem. We haven't had any serious side effects, except sometimes some stimulation and dysphoric mood if the amount is greater than the patient can tolerate. And we either back off or we just stop when we're ramping with that. Let me see if I can scroll this. Okay. Go back here. All right, let me just go right to the data we did. We measured some parameters, and what we have here is um, several things. Over to your right, um, are the platelet values. I used platelets as the um, acute phase reactant. I thought it was much more reliable. You can see some positive and negative um, amounts. 300,000 was our cutoff for normal. I can tell you about that when I used to be in pathology. That was our, our range for that. So a lot of our patients walk around chronically inflamed and have a lot of infectious load. Many of the patients, most of them, it went down. That's the part on the right. In the middle, we use succinic acid, both as a metabolic mitochondrial marker, but it's also spewed out by yeast. So we also saw that go down to a highly significant level. Um, now, some of the patients you'll see on the, on the right, there were 20 patients, and the other two are 22. We had some people who didn't complete all of the laboratories, so we had analyzed each of those sets significantly you know, uh, differently. We had better than 97.5 uh, confidence level with our data. Highly significant, okay, Tom's level well over 90%. I think that's spectacular in Tom's data. He didn't cherry pick these, he took the first seven that came off the assembly line. That is spectacular, I mean, by chance, it's so unlikely that would happen. Now over in the blue section to your left is glutathione levels. Many of us give glutathione to our patients, and many of those of us who are patients have received glutathione. Highly significant elevations of internal production of glutathione, this is reduced glutathione active glutathione, okay, measured in a laboratory with special test kits and so on. Highly significant, and a small number of people who already had high glutathione levels um, had some further elevations. Those were the people we always thought got stimulated. 
got wound up and needed only small doses of the curcumin. They already had high glutathione levels. So I know we want to open up the floor for some time um, here with questions and answers. So I'm going to be around. I know Tom's going to be around. If anyone has questions about the enhanced absorption curcuma and some of the other data. Okay, thank you very much. And I just had one other thing from my personal experience that was, was kind of exciting about the product um, from my perspective is that the vast majority, probably 85 or 90 percent of my patients get this covered by their insurance. So um, that's really been a, a nice benefit as well. So if anybody has any questions. I, I start with almost nothing, so it does almost zero. There's the, where, there it is. So we have a ramping protocol, and it's at the Lee Silsby table. Let me just say, Alan Israel did some things to help make sure people got the curcumin product while they were in the studies. He's very generous about that and so on. But one thing he also did is he butt out of the study. And he did that for Tom Moorcroft's uh, study that's ongoing too. And he doesn't try to influence this. He's very unbiased and he wants to know what the real data is. So this is the protocol I developed for the children. And it starts with um, 75 milligrams a day or the way I did it was 150 every other day. And every four days, give or take, you up it. So once or twice a week you go up and for uh, children under, say, 80 pounds, you'll ramp that up to about 600 milligrams. I do have some children on much more than that, and you keep going up if they keep getting benefits. I have some three-year-olds on 3,600 milligrams, which is a huge dose. I have some 150-pound adults, mostly women, who can't tolerate a big dose because, as you know, estrogen makes glutathione go up, and they already have high glutathione, some of them, although one of the people in the study the one that jumped the most from a low glutathione to a very high was a woman. But back to your question, we go up to 750 for adults and we ramp it up over three weeks. So there's no magic way to do it, but it's at the table over there and I've got the, uh, the ramping protocol with me. I can show it to anyone. But it's available on Lee Silsby's website and um, it, it's, it's, it's straightforward to do. And I do that with adults too. Now Tom started at 600 milligrams and I, I start with a low amount because some adults get stimulated from it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Dr. Moorcroft can answer what he's, his experience is too. Um, it's a mild blood thinner. Um, it's weaker than aspirin. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be that much dose dependent. I take 1,200 milligrams a day of it, and I don't bleed when I'm on it. I've gone up higher, 1,200 is enough for me. I rarely stop it before surgery. If it's central nervous system surgery, I will stop it. If it's any other kind of surgery, I don't bother stopping it. I stop the fish oil. I think what we all do, stop the fish oil, stop the vitamin E stop some of the other things that we have. CoQ10, I'll stop before surgery. I almost never stop Enhanza before surgery. And I think you'll find that that's variable with different products. There are some phosphorylated products there that do absorb because they're lipid, you know, soluble from the heat treatment and the esterification, which is all well and good. That's just not in this product. And they may be some things you might want to stop before surgery. I personally don't do that with Enhanza in my, pro my practice. And I get a lot of patients who get surgery. And unless the kid is getting a brain shunt or the adult is going to get some eye surgery, maybe, I, I, otherwise I don't stop it. But it is a mild blood thinner, and that's one of the benefits of it as a general health producing you know, um, product. Somebody over there is going to. Yes? Yeah, and the, the comment was that curcumin has uh, been viewed by many people as um, to be used for uh, type 2 diabetics, basically I'm paraphrasing, and it's as effective as metformin and some of the other oral agents. It does. There's a fair amount of literature out there, uh, there about blood sugar regulation with nothing else changing. You can have these patients that don't eat fiber and they eat a lot of sugar and, and they, they, they get better glucose regulation. It's true. 
It's mitochondrial supportive, it's antioxidant. Have you run into that, Tom? Um, in my practice, I haven't personally run across that um, being an issue. I mean, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the question is about um, gut inflammatory issues or, or GI side effects, more or less, Sen you know, gut sensitivities. And in, in my experience, the, you know, um, I have not seen people have a, a great um, difficulty with, with tolerating the product itself, in my estimation. I mean, there's a few people who seem to have pretty drastic, you know, candida yeast flares, which I think primarily is in their colons. So, um, but as far as sensitivity to the product, I haven't really seen that. Um, I don't know what your experience is, Dr. DeMio. Yeah, I, um, I don't know what kind of sensitivity you're talking about. If you're talking about rashes, you can get a variety of Herxheimer type rashes. I think that's what's happening. And then those usually go away. Uh, in my experience, the patients who have a high yeast load, as Dr. Moorcroft mentioned, get itching along the lateral torso from the hip almost to the axilla, and then it goes away. Sometimes they get a macular papular rash. We've seen that, and we've given countless doses. It's probably hundreds of thousands of doses of this over the last few years, and our patients, and very few of them get these problems, but that's one thing. Um, then there's a peculiar itching I've seen in a few patients on the lateral knees without a rash, and those patients only tolerate a very small dose, and it doesn't seem to go away, and those are the people that come in on follow-up, and they're sitting there while they're talking to you, itching their knee constantly. And there's three of them we've had do that. One of them's my son, and he's on it, and he takes you know, a dose that doesn't do that. Um, as far as other sensitivities, a small number of people will get nauseated with, uh, with any curcumin, and so this is no exception, and whether they take it with food or not. So if you spread it out during the day and almost have them use it in their food. So that's the other thing. And I have a list of some of the very few side effects that you really get with it. I mentioned sunburn, the itching is one, and the nausea, it's really, and we don't run into that very much. The one thing you'll run into if you just start with too high a dose is the person gets stimulated. They get wound up, they feel like they've had a, a pot of coffee to drink. And so that's why we started with a low amount in our ramping protocol built up. The question is, why did I use platelets as a marker in my study? I just found over the years that it was much more reliable than CRP and temperature and white blood cell count, for example, than I, I personally, just in my population. And in general, I've never found as a clinician that the C myself, and everybody in this room has you know, license to say whatever they want, I never found it to be as reliable. And being in pathology before I went back into clinical medicine, the platelet count levels for normal have gone up over the years because the labs are just complicit. They say, okay, well now, you know, it's normal for people to have high platelets because there's so many sick people in our population. And what I did is if it was outside of 300,000, the difference from 300,000, really, if it was over 300,000, most of the patients, you know, that's, many of those went down. If the platelets went down, then we counted that as a shift in the right direction, so that was a positive. I just found the CRPs, and in Tom's study, he even pointed out, the patients, that these people got better, the CRP went up. So is their immune system more active? Maybe, that's what I think, from looking at his data and talking to him about the patients in a good way. And then the second thing is that, um, that the platelets seem to go in the right direction, and I, I haven't found that variability with the CRP. It just is a little, more to my taste, I guess, is all I can say. It just seemed more reliable when they get better, it goes down. And, and, and also, this is going to be something that um, we'll have some more data on, too, from our adult studies, um, because we do have the platelet information and the, the remainder of the CRPs, and maybe we can see if the platelets are normalizing while CRPs go up, or if there's a trend in the CRPs in our adult Lyme patients as well. So that's uh, more to come on that one. Yeah, I did look at some other inflammatory markers. They're all over the place. The white cell count, the, the temperature, all kinds of things. And they, they just didn't match up any better than they did in other times I've looked at it. It was just my, my sense. There's someone way over there. Go ahead. He's just talking about senior population. Um, the, the question is um, our experience in a more uh, senior or elderly uh, population and their tolerance. Um, 
In, in, in my experience, I've probably at this point in my career used it in people maybe up to about 65 and they, so much more senior than that I can't really comment. I mean, I think that group so far is all sort of, you know, the, the children sort of have their thing and they, excuse me, the, uh, the adult population sort of falls into that. So I don't know if you have a particular experience with that because I haven't at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, for several years I've been deluged with the autism population, but we are, you know, seeing other people and we have ongoing gathering of data about the, the senior population with arthritis and, and we're getting that information. And one well-remembered patient, this is an anecdote, but it's pretty striking. She had not only neurocognitive improvements of symptom off antidepressants and all kinds of things, but she had had several joint replacements. This is why she came to see me. And I think we all have patients like that. They want help. They, they're tired of you know, uh, the well-intended but not desirable, you know, treatment options they're being given by uh, self-appointed conventional people. And she had had bilateral knee replacements. They told her they needed to do things in her hands and upper extremities. Cleveland is the mecca of hand surgery. And if you don't keep your hands in your pocket, they might get operated on. You have to be careful up there, okay? I'm the only hand surgeon, you know, you know, you know, not hand surgeon, I meant to say. You can fall over in Cleveland and touch a hand surgeon on the way down and two more on the ground. And so, um, you know, she didn't want that, you know, elbow replacements and shoulder replacements. Three months of this product, and I, I didn't want her to use another product because I was very confident this would absorb for her and so on. She is a bright person. She's off antidepressants and her joints feel great. And she always had some pain around the, the prosthetic joints, around the knees and some swelling and effusions, those are gone. And so our adult population has done pretty well with it. And the other pe people I have that have joint aches that aren't operative are people with chronic influenza and chronic inflammatory and viral syndromes and things, and they're doing, not everybody, I mean, I've stopped the product on some people if they get too stimulated or if it just doesn't work, but the majority of people do well and, and, um, and metabolic things improve for them and so on. So the seniors that I have, are, are, uh, that we've tried it on, mostly for joint problems, are doing pretty well. What is your question, please? You mean what's the mechanism of stimulation? I don't know, but it just does, and I, uh, maybe it's just like some people can't tolerate B vitamins because it does cause mitochondrial support. The glutathione goes up, mitochondrial markers improve, that's part of our succinic acid data there. And um, without changing yeast treatment or anything, we felt that the succinic was a marker of yeast and mitochondria and it was kind of mixed together, and as is the glutathione. So maybe, I don't know, I, I really don't, but we were observing that. And so we, that's, again, why I built in that protocol of starting from almost nothing and building up to a reasonable dose which is where the patient tells you it gives them benefits but doesn't stimulate them. Because it's an herbal, it's got a wide range of dosing. So, but I don't know why it stimulates, I really don't. And it doesn't do that in most people. Most people can take a huge dose and not get stimulated. Uh, it comes in a powder which is more finely divided and you want to use that powder um, and not open a capsule except the rare parent that wants to have it measured already and there's some scoopers that you're talking about the dosing for kids and the question is how hard is it to get it to the kids who have autism or people who aren't cooperative. Um, it, um, it tastes like a spice and most kids will take it. You can mix it in chili or spaghetti sauce or something but there are some people who hate the taste and they just won't take it. I'm surprised tasting it myself because I take it every day that more people don't refuse it as a, as a spicy taste. It's not a bad taste, it's just a spice. It tastes like pepper without the pepperiness or like, you know, like curry. Some of the kids do refuse it. Most of them will take it if you mix it in something. And for some of the kids, I'll have the parent mix it in oil, a bland oil that's tasteless until it, it's just not, you can't, we don't taste it on your tongue. And so we've been able to do that. Um, I am big on trying to teach people to swallow capsules. Some kids can and some can't, but have confidence in the kids because sometimes they can, not that you don't know that, but so a few kids will refuse it. And some parents and adults don't want to take it, but they, they swallow it. I tell those people, because you can taste a little bit of the powder on the outside of the capsule, to coat the powder in oil and just, to, I, mean, I mean the capsule, just dab some oil on it and swallow it and they can't taste it. Well, um, we'd really like to uh, thank you again and, and thanks to uh, Alan Israel from Lee Silsby Pharmacy for um, you know, helping out get a little more data for um, our Lyme patients and also for providing a nice breakfast and um, thanks for all the awesome questions. 
And if anybody has any other questions they think of, feel free to grab myself or Dr. DeMio uh, afterwards. And thanks again for all your time.